this video, I want to talk about a concept called phase portraits for our systems of differential equations. Um, a phase portrait is another way of interpreting and specifically a way of visualizing the solutions to the systems of differential equations that we've been looking at that gives us uh, a lot of insight into sort of the fundamental behaviors that we can expect to see. So uh, in general, the things that we look, looked at so far, we've solved systems that take the following form. They look like x prime equals a times x, where we should make it abundantly clear this x vector is really a vector that contains two components. Um, sometimes we call them x1 and x2. Oftentimes we are just calling them x and y as the two components. And these two components are fundamentally functions of time. So when we find a solution to this thing, what we're suggesting is that we've found x of t and y of t, two separate solutions for x and y, these two functions, and we can look and see what the behavior of those functions is individually as a function of time. So we can plot x and or y versus t using traditional techniques once we basically have uh, our solution. But I want to understand more about the interactions between x and y. If we want to understand the interactions, between x and y. So forget about t, basically. You should look at the phase portrait. And the phase portraits uh, are connected to these other traditional graphs that are related to t, but they're going to really give us more information about, again, the relationships between x and y and it's going to give us some insights into how to solve more complicated problems um, down the line. So what is a phase portrait or a phase diagram? Um, the book touches on these very briefly. So if you read the book, they talk about the phase portraits and they draw a couple pictures, but they're always off in the margins um, when, when they're solving the differential equations that, that we're interested in looking at. I want to kind of put them front and center here. So and let's look at our phase diagrams or phase portraits. I'll use those two terms interchangeably. Uh, so phase portrait slash diagram. OK. The idea is I want to, instead of pl plotting x as a function of time and having those be my two axes, or y as a function of time and having y and t my, be my two axes, I want to plot x versus y. Uh, the behavior of the two functions relative to one another. And we're going to wind up with pictures that indicate the behavior, and each one is going to follow kind of the different cases that we looked at when we looked at our solutions. So let's start with the case where we had um, real distinct eigenvalues. So if we're looking at real distinct eigenvalues, uh, so we, let's say lambda 1 and lambda 2, we're going to have different kinds of pictures. So let me draw x and y first here. And let's look at it in the context of an actual example here. So here's my x, and here's my y. And the first case that we did uh, is something that looks like this. I'm just going to copy down the solution that we got at the end of our first problem, uh, the first example that we did in when we were talking about the problems from uh, section 8.2. So basically we had, let me get this out here, we had x prime was equal to, our matrix was 2, 3, 4, 3 times x 
And after solving it, we wound up with a solution that x, which again, remember that's really our x and our y, right? The x vector contains both of the variables, both of the functions that we solve for, both x and y that are functions of t. And we wound up with a solution that looked like this. It was c1, the eigenvector was 1, negative 1, times e to the negative t, plus c2, uh, times the eigenvector was 3, 4, and that was associated with an eigenvalue of 6. So this was an, an example that we already looked at, looked at, and I want to check out and see what happens here. The idea is I want to figure out sort of what is the long-term behavior and or what happens if we change the different values of c. So what if we have some conditions, initial conditions that we apply, and want to figure out what these values of c1 and c2 are. What does the behavior wind up looking like in these different cases? Um, <clears throat> well, there's going to be a couple of things that are going to happen. Think about what happens as t gets really large. So as t approaches infinity, what's going to happen in this equation? Well, these terms out here are constants, the c1 and the vector 1, negative 1, right? That's not going to change. It has no time dependence. Similarly, over here, c2 and the vector 3, 4 has no time dependence. The only time dependence shows up here in the exponentials. And as t goes to infinity, this exponent will go to negative infinity. And e to the negative infinity, this term, is going to approach 0. So for very large values of t, Basically, this term is going to go to zero. It's going to disappear. So as t goes to infinity, e to the negative t approaches zero, while on the other hand, this term, e to the 6t, is going to approach infinity. And you can almost think of these as kind of the weights between these two separate pieces that we have making up our solution. So for large values of t, this term becomes totally unimportant, and this dominates the behavior of our system. Similarly, what happens if we go backwards in time? What if we went to t equals negative infinity? So literally, imagine going backwards in time. If I plug in negative infinity, or take the limits rather, as t approaches negative infinity in each of these cases, in this case, as t goes to negative infinity, the negative sign sitting out here will cancel the negative sign associated with the negative infinity, and this term will go to positive infinity. So e to the negative t approaches infinity, while conversely, the e to the 6t term, as t goes to negative infinity here, this whole power is going to go to negative infinity, and the exponential will go to zero. So what it's suggesting is that for very large positive values of time, this term, the first term is unimportant, and this term is going to dominate the behavior. Whereas for very large negative values of time, this term becomes unimportant, and this term dominates the behavior. And so what I'm going to do to kind of get a sense of how these things transition, so what about for like medium values of time? What about like time equals zero? Well, when time is equal to zero, this term and this term both become one, and we get more or less equal weights of these two pieces, depending on what our values of c1 and c2 wind up being. But both play a role in determining uh, the behavior of the system. So what I want to do is kind of think about the two extremes. So I'm going to draw in some lines that go in the directions of the eigenvectors, because we've decided that those are going to be important, they should play an important role in the behavior of the system. So the first one I'm going to draw in is the 1, negative 1. So 1, negative 1 is a line that goes in this direction, right? Over 1, down 1. That is how you would do it, right? So 1 in the x direction, negative 1 in the y direction would give us basically a line with a slope of negative 1. Uh, this one, we need to go 3 in the x direction, 4 in the y direction, so it's going to be a line that looks slightly steeper than a slope of 1. It's going to have a slope of 4 thirds. It goes up in this direction. 
So if I want to think of this as being our k1 vector eigenvector and this second one being our k2 eigenvector, um, I can label each of these. This one was our k2, and this one down here was our k1 vector. Um, and what we're suggesting is that for large values of time, so in this case, as t goes to infinity, this term goes to zero. And basically our solution should have, no, this part should have no effect. So our one negative one vector should have no role in determining the behavior. And instead, the behavior should look similar to this. We should be moving in the direction of 3, 4. Uh, and so that means that we're ultimately going to wind up parallel to this vector for large values of time. And what we wind up getting are a couple of interesting things. So one other thing that I should point out before we jump into drawing the remainder of the picture here is what happens um, if, if we play around with the weights, C1 and C2. So we talked about letting T get large. What if we fiddle, instead of playing with T, what if we fiddle with C1 and C2? What if C1 is 1, or anything for that matter, but I force C2 to be 0? So if C2 is 0, then again, this term has no role on the behavior, and our solutions will stay, regardless of the value of t, uh, of t, this e to the negative t, right? This number can change depending on the value of t. This number is maybe pre-specified. Maybe we just pick 1. doesn't really matter. But between the two of them, it's just going to be some number that we're going to be scaling times this vector 1, negative 1. So we're going to multiply the vector 1, negative 1 times some number over here for a given value of t. So whatever you want to pick. If t equals 1, say c1 equals 1, then uh, or better yet, t equals 0, then we get e to the 0 here, which would be 1. If c1 was 1, the coefficient of all of this would just be 1. And we would literally be at the point 1, negative 1. We would be at this exact location on the graph if c1 is 1, uh, c2 is 0, and t is 0. It puts us right there on the graph. right? So c1 being 1 means this is a 1, c2 being 0 means this whole term we don't care about, and t being equal to 0 just was a convenient value to plug in because I know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, we plugged in 0 here, and this became 1. And so we wound up at this point. And what would happen if we decided to increase the value of time? So we went from time 0 to time 1. Well, now we'd get e to the negative 1. e to the negative 1 is the same as 1 over e. I don't know exactly what that is, but e is like 2 point whatever, 2 points, excuse me, 2.6 something something something. So we'd have 1 over 2.6 something something something. Uh, we'd have a number that was tiny. Maybe this is a decimal around, I don't know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that. And that would be our scaling factor that we would be multiplying by. So if we went from t equals 0, we'd be at this point. By the time we got to t equals 1, so again, I'm not changing anything else. c1 is still 1, c2 is still 0, but I'm letting t go to 1. All that changes is this number, instead of being 1, would have shrunk to a number like 0.3 or 0.4. And all that would have done is take, taken us from the point 1, negative 1, to the point 0.3, negative 0.3. It would have moved us from this point to maybe this point. As we went from t equals 0, here's the corresponding point at t equals 1. We would just be moving in, in that direction. And what happens in this case as t goes to infinity? Well, the same thing that we talked about is t goes to infinity. So again, let c1 be equal to 1, c2 be equal to 0, and now let t go to infinity. Here's t equals 0, t equals 1. What happens when t goes to infinity? What are we going to be scaling our vector 1, negative 1 by? As t goes to infinity, this coefficient goes to 0, and we wind up moving to the origin. So the origin would be when t is you know, approaching infinity. I don't want to say equals infinity. But as t approaches infinity, we move to the origin. So basically, by letting c1 be 1 and c2 be 0, we're stuck on this eigenvector, the eigenvector associated with c1. And we move up and down that eigenvector, in and out on that eigenvector, 
by changing the value of t. The same thing would happen if instead I let c2 be equal to 0 and c1 be equal to 1. It would mean that this term was now gone, and I'd be stuck on the second eigenvector. And depending on the value of t that we chose to plug in, I would be at some location on here. Uh, and as t goes to infinity in this case, this number is getting larger and larger. We would actually be scaling up and getting larger and larger values. So basically, as t went to infinity, this term went to 0. But as t went to infinity, this term went to infinity, right? We saw that down here. So the numbers that we were scaling this eigenvector by were getting smaller and smaller and smaller, approaching 0, which made us move towards the origin. Alternatively, if I was stuck on the other eigenvector and letting t go to infinity, so again, we've let this term be 0, it's canceled out, c1 is equal to 0, c2 is equal to 1, so we're stuck on this vector. The only thing that's going to scale us and move us along this vector here is the value of t. And now as t goes to infinity, this whole thing goes to infinity. So instead of moving toward the origin, I would be moving from a point when, say, t equals 0 would be at the point, whatever, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. We'd be over here at this point at t equals 0. And we would be moving out in that direction as t goes to infinity. So we'd be moving away from the origin. And so what this tells us is a little bit about kind of the fundamental behavior. Whenever we have a positive eigenvalue, we wind up with one of these exponentials uh, that's a growing exponential. And whenever we have a negative eigenvalue, the ne I, I, eigenvalue associated with this one was negative 1, the power here, we wind up moving towards the origin as time gets large. And so we can talk about the idea of stability in this case. We can figure out kind of what's the behavior in between. So we've talked about the two extreme cases where we're stuck on one of the eigenvectors by making either c1 be 0 or c2 be 0. But what if both of them are non-zero? If we have both contributions, it moves us somewhere else on the graph. It moves us off of these two axes to another point. And we wind up getting behavior that in as much uh, as time gets, so as time progresses, if we started at some point over here, let me do it in another color. Uh, in fact, let's do it over here just to make life easy. If I started over here, at this point, you could imagine this being basically some negative c1 value would move us back over here, and some small positive c2 value would put us at this point. Um, and I'm getting that by, again, just thinking about how do I get to this location? How do I move along this axis and this axis? So think of, instead of the x and y, think of our two eigenvectors as kind of what we're navigating relative to. So to get to this point, I would go, want to go kind of backwards on this k1 vector a little bit, and then we could go out parallel to the k2 vector a little bit, a small positive amount to get to this point. And that would mean we basically took a negative c1 value to get back here and a positive c2 value to get back here to get over to this point. What's going to happen as we then start to let t go to infinity? So as time grows, this term is going to get smaller, and this coefficient, overall coefficient of the 1, negative 1 will get smaller, which will move us in this direction, sort of parallel to this vector towards the origin. But at the same time, this term is growing, and it means I'll be moving parallel to this one in an increasing amount. So as while I'm going in this direction, I'm also wanting to go in this direction, so towards the origin in the k1 direction away from the origin in the k2 direction. And we start to get behaviors that look like this. They start to come this way, and then they turn and go that way. And if we started at a different point, we'd get a slightly different picture. If we started over here, we'd get something that looks like this. And we wind up, draw them all in here, with a phase diagram that looks like the parts that I've drawn in red. That's going to be what our phase portrait is. It's all of these curves that correspond to different c values, c1 and c2, and different values of time. Um, you can travel along one of these curves as you increase time. And so the direction is important. These arrows that I put on the end is important, what directions we're going. And so again, I want to think about what's going on 
for the large values of time. Now that I've drawn these pictures, let's try to make sense. Why did I know that these curves were going to go in the directions that I just drew them as red? Well, let's think about negative time. So negative time would be the opposite of the direction I drew the arrows, right? If you want to think of these as um, moving forward in time, moving forward in time corresponds to the direction I've drawn the arrows, then moving backwards in time would be moving counter to the arrows. So for large negative values of time, we should wind up having this term dominate and this term go to zero. Meaning, comparing that to our solution that we had over here, the e to the negative term, e to the negative t term is going to dominate, meaning this term will dominate, whereas this term goes to zero, meaning this term goes to zero. So for large negative values of time, I should get solutions that are parallel to the vector 1, negative 1, that are parallel to k1. And so notice, if you go kind of backwards on all of our arrows, what starts to happen to the curve as we move backwards on all of these arrows? They all start to wind up going parallel to our vector k1, to the one associated with the term that dominates for large, value, large values of negative time. What happens as we move forward in time to large values of positive time? Well, we said as we move to large positive values of time, this term goes to zero and this term dominates, meaning, again, this term is going to disappear. We won't have any uh, behavior relative to the, the vector 1, negative 1. This term will dominate. Everything should become parallel to 3, 4. And that's what we see happening towards the other ends of our arrows. As time increases, our curves stop being at all parallel to k1 vector, and they start becoming parallel to the k2 vector for large values of time because this term is dominating for large t, this term dominates for large negative t. And so we see this type of behavior. So this is the idea. Let me break it down and kind of characterize the types of behavior we see um, in this situation. So a couple of things can happen. First is what we just saw. So let's just say hypothetically, here are the possibilities. Let me draw a couple of these next to each other. Kind of do them all at once. Myself a little bit more room. Okay, so x, y, x, y, x, y. Here's our positive x and y directions of our axes. And let's just say I'm going to pick um, eigenvectors similar to the ones that we just picked up here. But let's say that on one of these problems, we find our two eigenvectors and we draw them in. And so maybe one eigenvector goes like this, and the other eigenvector goes like this. And I'll do exactly what I did a minute ago. Let me label them. Here's the eigenvector k1 and the eigenvector k2. And same thing here. Let me just copy these over. Uh, and the reason I'm drawing three of these is because we're actually going to have three different sets of behavior depending on what the eigenvalues look like. So let's just say, hypothetically, we've solved our problem. And these are what our eigenvectors look like. These are the directions that they go. So k2 and k1. OK. In this first case, I want to look at the case that we just looked at. In the case that we just looked at, we had one positive exponential and one negative exponential in our solution. And that was because one eigenvalue was negative and one eigenvalue was positive. So in this case, I want to look at the case that basically we have um, Let's say lambda 1 is less than 0, and lambda 2 is greater than 0. So we have two eigenvalues, one positive and one negative. Whichever one is negative, that's going to be the vector that we basically start parallel to. So because lambda 1 is the negative one, it's going to be the term that dominates for negative values of time. So all of my curves that I draw should start off parallel to this vector. But for large values of time, as t grows, eventually this term, the exponentials associated with this eigenvalue, go away, and these ones grow to dominate. And so for large values of t, we should wind up uh, parallel to the eigenvector associated with lambda 2, which would be our k2. And we wind up with solutions that look kind of like the one we drew above. So we start off parallel to the k1, and then we eventually switch and become parallel to k2. And we can kind of just draw, eyeball some pictures in here. Just kind of guessing. All we really care about is the general behavior, not specifics.
and this allows us to talk a little bit about stability. We're moving outward on the K2 vector because it has a positive eigenvalue associated with it, but we're moving inward on the K1 vector because it has a negative eigenvalue associated with it. This is called a saddle when we have one positive and one negative. That's the name of this shape of this diagram. Let's imagine a case where instead we have lambda 1 greater than lambda 2 greater than 0. So they're both positive, and let's say that lambda 1 is the larger one. What happens in that case? Well, now basically as time grows, we can imagine, we'll maybe look at some more examples down the line, but as time is growing, right, we're going to have some, our solution looks like this. So our solution x is going to look like c1 times k1 e to the lambda 1t plus c2 k2 e to the lambda 2t. Right, this is our solution. Lambda 1 is associated with the eigenvector k1. That's this one right here. Lambda 2 is associated with the eigenvector k2. That's this one right here. Well, what's going to happen in this case? Think about again what's happening for large values of t and small values of t. So for really large values of t, both these terms are growing because they're both positive exponentials. But if this is a larger number, what grows faster, e to the 2t or e to the t? Right? If the two coefficients, this one's a 2, this one's a 1, they're both positive. But which one of these grows faster for large values of t? It turns out this one grows faster. You could think of it as literally e to the t times e to the t. It grows e to the t times faster than the other one. Uh, using our exponent rules. So it's a lot bigger. And that means that this term winds up dominating. Whichever one has the larger eigenvalue winds up dominating for large values of t. And so in this case, we're saying lambda 1 is the larger eigenvalue. For large values of t, we should wind up parallel to k1. Uh, what about, so that's telling me for large values of t, I should be going this direction, parallel to k1. What about the large values of negative t? So same thing, but now we're letting these go to negative infinity. So basically think about like e to the negative 2t versus e to the negative t as t goes to infinity. Right? Instead of uh, doing the same ones, I've basically taken the negative sign off of the infinity and just made it explicitly plugged into those two locations. What we're really doing, I should say, is this. We've got the same two solutions we had before with t going to negative infinity, but I think an easier way to think about it is let's pick the negative sign off of it and put it up actually in the places where t is going to be anyways, so let's make that negative and then just let t go to positive infinity. So these two things should have the same behavior, these two scenarios I've got right here. So what is going to happen in this case? Well, they're both going to zero, right? Both of these are going to zero, same thing here. They're both going to zero, but which one's going to zero more quickly? Well, just like this one went to infinity more quickly, it's also going to go to zero more quickly. And what that means is because it's closer to zero than this one for large values of negative time, this is the one that dominates, right? It's going to be much larger. They're both going to be tiny numbers, but if they're going to both heading to zero, maybe this one's 0 0.01, whereas this one is going there much faster. So it's 0 0.0001 or something like that. And even though they're both tiny, this one's now 100 times larger than this one. And so when we compare the two, this term dramatically dominates compared to this one. So the suggestion is for negative time, we should start off parallel to k2. And for large values of time, we should wind up parallel to k1. And what we wind up with are pictures that look essentially um, like this one. Let's see if I can draw this. So we're going to start parallel to k2. Uh, we are going to be moving outward away from the origin because they're both positive. So right, we're going outward in this direction. We would also be going outward in this direction. So think about the signs of the eigenvalues as dictating which direction we should be moving along our eigenvectors. Right, A negative eigenvalue means we're kind of going towards the center as t goes to infinity. We're going to zero whereas a positive eigenvalue means we're blowing up to infinity as t goes large. In this case, they're all blowing up towards infinity. We're going outward in every case, but they all need to start off parallel to k2, as we said down here. It dominates for 
large negative values of time, and then they need to wind up parallel to k1. And so we wind up with our pictures that look like this. We start off going this way, and then eventually turn and go like this. Like this. Same thing possibly the other direction, going like this. Going like this. Going like this. Going like this. All the points are going away from the origin. If you let t go to negative infinity, both these terms are going to go to zero, right? Both these exponentials will go to zero and will wind up at the origin, right? The coefficient of the k1 will be zero, the coefficient of k2 will be zero. We're starting at the origin. t equals negative infinity is right here. And as time grows, we move out from the origin and away from it. We start off moving more in the k, excuse me, k2 direction, and eventually, once t gets large and positive, we be, wind up parallel to the k1 direction. This term is what's called, and let me erase all of this now just so I have more room to write. This is called a node, and specifically it's called an unstable node. It's unstable because the solutions, as you can see, are all blowing up and going away from the origin. So this is an unstable node. I want to now look at the case, the last case, what if lambda 1 is less than lambda 2 is less than 0? So they're both negative. By the same arguments, what's going to be happening in this case, let me move that arrow. We have the same thing, but I'm going to make it very clear. We have now our solution x, which looks like c1, k1, e to the, let me make it very explicit. Here's the negative sign, so negative lambda 1 t. I'm making the negative sign here. Um, in fact, maybe this is going to be misleading. Let me just do lambda 1 still, but now it's negative, right? So let me just point that out. Negative plus C2 K2 e to the lambda 2 t. And again, that is also negative. So <clears throat> now what happens is t goes to infinity. Well, as t goes to infinity, these are both negative exponentials. So this one's going to go to zero, and this one's going to go to zero. So for as t goes to infinity, those coefficients both are going to become zero. These exponentials both become zero, and I get zero k1s plus zero k2. I'm at the origin. I'm moving towards the origin in this case for large values of time. We just need to, again, figure out which one kind of dominates. And so by the same logic we went through before, knowing that they're both negative, but this one's more negative than this one, right? So maybe this is negative two and this is negative one. They're both negative. Uh, we just need to figure out basically, again, where is where are things going to dominate? And in this case, we'll wind up starting, so for very large negative values of t, right? So basically same thing, e to the negative two t, let's say that that's associated with this one e to the negative t, that's the one associated over here. If I plug in negative values of time, so meaning we're far from the origin, which one of these two things is going to dominate? So when t is negative, right, these exponents become positive, which one is bigger? So as t goes to negative infinity, the negative signs cancel, and this is basically e to the 2 infinity, this is e to the 1 infinity. Which one's bigger? The e to the 2 infinity. So for negative time, this is the dominant term. I start off parallel to k1. So we're going to start off parallel to k1, and then what happens as t goes to positive uh, infinity? Well, as t goes to positive infinity, there is no negative sign to cancel down here, so this will become e to the negative 2 infinity and e to the negative infinity. They're both going to zero, but again, by the same argument, this one's going to zero slower, so meaning it's a larger value than this one over here, even though they're both getting tiny. This one's going to be a lot bigger than this one, and we wind up parallel to k2 for large positive values of time. And so we get curves that wind up looking like this. They start off parallel to k1, and they eventually become parallel to k2. They're all moving, in this case, inward because they're moving towards the origin. So you get these weird spidery looking things. And again, using the same notation and discussion that we did a minute ago, let me just remind you, let me point these arrows and say that these are negative 
them up here, just to remind you that they're negative, we wind up with what's called a stable node. Stable because the solutions are converging to a finite point, in this case, the origin. So these are the three cases you can get when you have real distinct eigenvalues. If they're both positive, you're going to get an unstable node. If they're both negative, you're going to get a stable node. And if one's positive and one's negative, you wind up with what's called a saddle. And you'll want to determine basically the, the behavior um, of where we start off parallel to and where we wind up parallel to, as we did in all of these cases, by determining basically which of your two terms dominates for large values of t and for large negative values of t, so large positive and large negative values of t. Figure out which term dominates. Okay, so that's the real distinct. Let's look at what happens by the same logic in the real repeated case. So real repeated meaning, how did I write it up here? Let me just take a quick peek. Okay, so up there I wrote lambda 1 and lambda 2. If it's real and repeated, we don't have a lambda 1 and a lambda 2. We just have a lambda 1. So lambda 1 essentially equals lambda 2. Um, <clears throat> and let's just say for sake of argument that this is, that they're both greater than 0. They're both positive in this case. Well, what winds up happening is, let's draw our picture. So here's my x, here's my y. We only find one eigenvalue, and we only find one associated eigenvector, and our solution winds up looking like, I'm trying to remember, so we get like c1 times k1 e to the lambda 1 t, plus we get this other term, c2 times uh, a big mess. We get a k1 t e to the lambda 1 t plus some other eigenvector that we called our generalized eigenvector times e to the lambda 1 t. So this is the general form of our solution for a repeated eigenvalue. You'll have to go through that process if you want to think, of, think about it again. But we only have one eigenvector, so let's just pick a direction for it to go. I'm just going to arbitrarily say here's, let's imagine that this is my k1 eigenvector. We only have one. Well, what's the behavior going to be here? Uh, I know if lambda is positive, which we said it is, it's greater than zero here, that means that basically negative infinity, time equals negative infinity, corresponds to the origin, and we're moving out away from the origin, just like in the other examples. Um, <clears throat> if we basically try to figure out, so what's going to happen for large values of t, large values of negative t, what essentially happens is, so let's, as t goes to, for example, um, negative infinity. Because lambda is positive, if t is a large negative number, this term is going to 0. And that means this term is going to 0. And that means this term is going to 0. So all our exponentials are going to go to 0. But which one is going to be um, the largest? Well, in this case, it's going to be kind of this term that winds up dictating the important behavior because Essentially, we wind up with like negative infinity e to the lambda times a negative infinity, right? So this part's going to zero, but we have this other term that's the t sitting out in front of it that's, again, trying to blow it up to negative infinity. And on these other terms, we have the part that's going to zero. We have the part that's going to zero, but there's no infinity term, or in this case, negative infinity term to counterbalance that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off, again, parallel to k1, moving in this case outward from the origin, so moving along in either direction depending on the value of c2, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. And then eventually t will get to a more reasonable value, so intermediate values of t, t equals 0. By the time t equals 0, this term will have some value, so we'll still have some component parallel to k1. This term is going to go to 0 because of the t sitting here. So when t is 0, this term is gone. And we're also going to have a contribution from this term because when t is 0, this term will be 1. So we'll have a combination of k1 and p. And p is, again, that generalized eigenvector. It's going to look however it happens to look. But what we'll see is we'll start to veer off 
of basically what this curve looks like. And eventually what happens as t gets to be very large, well, as t gets large again, what will happen is, again, all of these terms will now be going to infinity. So again, lambda is positive. So as t goes to infinity, we've got an e to the infinity here. So that's blowing up. We have an e to the infinity here. That's blowing up. But here, we not only have an e to the infinity, but we're multiplying it by a positive infinity. So this is a larger, infinitely larger term than these other terms in a sense, right? It's t times larger. So for large values of t, this term is going to dominate again much more than these. So for large negative values of t, this term dominates. And for large positive values of t, this term dominates, meaning we both start parallel to k1 for large negative values of t. Oops. And then we also wind up parallel to k1 for large positive values of t. So I've started to turn away from it. And what happens is it actually loops around and then winds up back parallel to k1 again. We get these loop arounds. And the same thing goes off in the other direction. We get these like almost, it's looking like it's trying to spiral, but it never quite spirals. It like levels out and becomes again parallel to K1. So it starts parallel to K1, then it has influence of P and goes not parallel to K1. And then eventually this term dominates again and it becomes parallel to K1 again. So to our eigenvector. And you get these turns that look like this. And how do I know that it went this way and this way? as opposed to, right, why couldn't I, let me just draw it in red over here, why didn't it go this way and this way instead, right? How did I know that my spiral kind of looks like it's going kind of counterclockwise as opposed to going clockwise? Uh, and there's going to be a way that we can actually determine that in just a little bit. So, But for now, I just want you to know the general shape, and in a little bit we'll talk about, oh, does this go clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, and again, this is uh, an unstable one because they were both positive. If it had been, um, if they'd both been negative instead, if it had been real repeated but they were both negative, it would be the same picture but the arrows would be switched around. Instead of going out from the origin, they would be moving in towards the origin. This type of situation is what's called an improper node. And this one happens to be unstable, but there is also a stable version of it, again, if we had just flipped the eigenvalue, the repeated eigenvalue to be a negative eigenvalue instead of positive. So it's unstable if lambda 1 greater than 0, stable if lambda 1 less than 0, if it's negative. So that's called an improper node. The last thing I want to talk about are the case where we have complex conjugate values for our eigenvalues. So Right, lambda now looks like some alpha plus or minus beta i. These were the really ugly ones to solve that involved uh, exponentials, assuming that there was a real part here, plus sines and cosines. And what we wind up with in these situations is, let me just draw them. We're going to have a couple cases again here, so let me draw a few. Take a look. In these cases, here's my x's, here's my y's. We don't really care about the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors wound up being complex things anyways, so I'm not going to be able to plot them on here. I don't know what that even looks like. But we wind up with a spiral. And it spirals. And we'll talk about this in just a second for a couple of reasons. So let's say there's that one. Um, let's do the same thing. So one that goes very similar. But now instead of going outward, we have one that's maybe going inward, right towards the center, whereas this one was going outward away from the center. So this would be a case where, again, these two are called spirals. This is the case where our value of alpha, the real component, is positive. And here's the case where it's negative. Right? So in our complex eigenvalue, this is the part. The beta is what gives us sines and cosines. It gives us periodic behavior. 
the alpha is what gives us exponentials. Um, so let's come back to these in just a minute after I draw the case where alpha is equal to zero. So what happens if we get pure imaginary eigenvalues? Well, we've seen the same kind of thing happen before. When we get pure imaginary eigenvalues, there are no exponential terms. We only get sines and cosines in our solutions. And what we wind up with in that case is pictures that look like this. They look like kind of bullseye shapes, and they're called a center. And you can go clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on some things that we'll test in a little bit. But this is the case where alpha is equal to zero. And the reason is our solution here might look like basically um, right, some ugly mess. So let me let me try to be as specific as possible because we've already gone through and seen how bad the algebra can be here. But basically, we wind up with a situation where we've got like um, oh, what is it? Uh, we've got some sort of right C one times some big mess that involves like a cosine and sine terms. So I think we used B for the coefficients to represent the real parts of the eigenvectors and so on and so forth. Um, I'm trying to think of what's the easiest way to write this compactly. Let me just cheat a little bit and just say it's going to look vaguely like this, right? We'll have some C1 times some real part of the eigenvector. So real part of our eigenvector, K1. And it gets multiplied by basically like some sines and cosine terms. Um, so like cosine of beta t plus we're going to have some imaginary part of K1 times the sine of beta t. And then we're also going to have like some components that switch these um, depending on, right, again, so there's a C1 term plus a similar C2 term. You could imagine it kind of set up like that, and it creates a big ugly vector. So let me just say this. The, the point is, if you go back and, and look at the general form, and the general form is more complicated to write. It's hard to write in a closed form like this. But the point is, we've got these cosine terms and sine terms. I'm trying to argue that I don't really care about the eigenvectors. All I care about is what's going on with the sines and cosines. Think about the behavior of a sine and cosine. If we have a function, a solution, so let me give you the actual specific solution that we got, um, and it's going to meet one of these spiral cases over here. So let's go back to that specific solution that we had. We had an example that looks like x prime is equal to, um, let me find the matrix. I don't have it written right in front of me. Where did I put it? Sorry, thought I had it. It looks like, okay, four, five, negative two, six. So this is the same example that we did uh, in the previous video that led us to complex ugly messes. And that complex Plex ugly mess looks specifically like this. It looks like some constant times, in this case, e to the 5t, so we had an exponential, times a big mess. We had a 1, 5, nope, 5, 1, rather. So I'm just copying this down from the solution that we got before. 5, 1 times cosine of 3t minus 0, 3, sine of 3t, good, plus, for compactness, let me write it below, e to the 5t times 5, 1, sine of 3t plus 0, 3, cosine of 3t. Okay, so let's look at this specific example. That's all I was meaning to try to write over here. I was trying to come up with a clever shorthand way to do it wasn't very successful. So here's a specific solution that we found. What I want to think about is specifically that basically the x's and y's, remember the the this is a vector, right? It has a top component and a bottom component. When we distribute through, we wind up with one big vector. The top is x, the bottom is y. 
And what's happening is we've got sine and cosine terms. And what happens if we let like um, something be simple? So let's say, um, what's a good way to do this? Let's just imagine what happens if, what happens separately? Let's just say, I wanna plot like y equals cosine of t, x equals sine of t. What if we just had this? What if we simplified it such that the, um, I guess I wrote them in reverse, x equals sine t, y equals cosine t. There we go. So what if it worked out so that our top term in our vector here simplified and all that was left was a sine on top. And all that was left on the bottom was a cosine. We're gonna get the same types of behavior from this. Well, our sine term, if we wanna think about what x is doing as a function of time, right? If this is x as a function of time, and then separately we'll plot y as a function of time. x is a sine function, so it's going like this. And y is a cosine function, so it's going like this. There is our same value in time, say 2 pi out. So the value of x starts off at 0, then goes positive, then goes back down to 0, then goes negative, then goes back to 0. And so if I were to translate that over here, what I'm suggesting is as we move in the x direction, as time increases, we're going to start at 0. We're going to initially move in the positive direction. Then we're going to turn around and go in the negative direction, and then we're going to come back and move in the positive direction, and that'll be one period, right? Positive, so that's the equivalent of going up initially, then from here on we go down, and then from here we go back up, right? So up, big down, little up again. So up, big down, little up. Simultaneously, cosine is starting off positive, and it's just going negative, and then it's turned around and goes positive after that. So we have these two kind of periodic behaviors that are going on. So I want to think about these arrows out of the way. What's going to happen? So at t equals 0, what point would we start at if this was the vector x? So imagine this is our vector x that we're looking at, that it looks like this. Well, at t equals 0, our x component's going to be 0, and our y component's going to be 1. So we'd start at this point. This would be t equals 0. Right? It's the point 0 in the x direction, 1 in the y direction. As time increases, x is going to grow, meaning I'm going to be moving towards the right. y is going to decrease, so I'm going to also be going down. So I'm going to be starting off going in this direction. Right. x is increasing, I'm moving to the right, but I'm the y value is decreasing, meaning I'm moving down. And eventually we'll get to a point over here. This point right here, uh, in fact, let's do this point. Let's do all of, let's do these, let's color code them. So red point, red point, we'll do blue point, blue point, and then we'll do green point, green point. So these are values in time, so to speak. Yellow point, yellow point. We already did the, the starting point is our black point. So where's the red point? The red point occurs in this case at basically time pi over 2. And at time pi over 2, the x value will have reached its maximum value of 1, but the y value will have moved down to 0. We will wind up at this point. Right? This is the point where x is equal to 1, x is equal to a height of 1, and the y value has a height of 0 here. So the y value on this graph is 0. Right? x is 1, y is 0. From there, we'll move to the blue point. The blue point is where x is back to 0. So we decrease from a height of 1 back down to 0. So I've gone from 1 in the x direction, now we're starting to head back towards 0. And with y, on the other hand, I keep going from uh, in the negative direction. I went from a height of 1 to a height of 0. And now, by the time I get to blue, I'm going to be at a height of negative 1 we wind up at this point. This is the point where x is back down to 0, x is back down to 0, and y is down to negative 1, y is down to negative 1. So we wind up at this point. All right? This is basically just polar coordinates, if you're familiar with that. I've just switched the role of the sine and the cosine. 
The green point corresponds to here, and then the yellow point corresponds back to where we started. And we complete a periodic loop in this manner. This is the path that we are taking. The effect of these other coefficients that show up in our vectors is to stretch this so that it's no longer a perfect circle. We instead get ovals that may be stretched in one direction or another. And that has to do, again, with simply the values that show up in the eigenvectors. What would the effect be if we compounded this behavior and suddenly put in an e to the t times the whole thing? Because that's essentially what we've done here. We've added in an exponential. Well, you can think of this as basically being uh, sort of our amplitude term. So as time grows, the sine and cosines are going to be periodic. They're just going to be tracing circles. But the amplitude of those circles is going to be basically proportional to this e to the t term. The height of these oscillations is t, go, t grows, the e to the t would also grow, and these oscillations would start to get bigger and bigger. So this was a graph of like sine of t. What would it look like if it, instead it was uh, e to the t sine of t? Well, in that case, it would start off like this, similar, but over time, these oscillations would start to grow more and more. You delete that, and you get growing amplitude in our oscillations. So not only are we spinning this way, but our oscillations are now getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what do we wind up doing? We wind up drawing out a spiral. So if you have that exponential term, you'll have a spiral that either grows or decays towards the origin, right? If alpha is zero, if your exponential is a growing exponential, you'll be spiraling outward. If it's a decaying exponential, you'll be spiraling inward. Your amplitudes will be decreasing. And if there is no real part, meaning the exponential's gone and you only have sines or cosines, you're just going to stay on a closed path, on a periodic loop, go around and around and around forever. And that's what yields the center versus the spirals. So the last question is clockwise versus counterclockwise. Okay, how do we know? Um, <clears throat> a lot of the times, the easiest way to do this is go back to the original equation here. And I think this is going to be the case. So I'm going to write this as x prime equals, again, let me just copy that down. It's 4, 5, negative 2, 6 times x. And what I want to think about in this particular case is what is another in interpretation of the, the derivative term here? This is a derivative with respect to t, meaning it's a velocity. You can think of it as a velocity. And so if this is a velocity, this is going to dictate what direction we're going initially. So what we can do is we can actually plug in an xy coordinate and see what our initial velocity is going to be. So we can just pick a point essentially on our graph. And so if we've got a case like this, and I know it's an outward spiral, so let's say we've determined in this case it's an outward spiral, which we, we have, right? It's an outward spiral because we have an e to the 5t, that means it's growing, there's sines and cosines, so it's spiraling. So I know it's something like this. I just don't know if we're spiraling out in a counterclockwise manner or are we spiraling out in a counterclockwise manner. Well, all I need to do is pick one point. So let's pick a convenient point. Let's pick like this point right here. Let's pick the point x equals 0, y equals 1. And let's see if at that point, as we move through this point, are we moving to the left in the counterclockwise direction or is our velocity to the right in the clockwise direction? So let's plug that in. All we're doing, so check the point where our vector x is 0, 1. And so we're going to plug that in in place right here to find out what the velocity is. So let's find that velocity. We're going to get 4, 5, negative 2, 6 times 0, 1. And when we do our matrix multiplication, what we're going to wind up with, in this case, is 4 times 0 plus 5 times 1 on top, and then for the bottom we'll get negative 2 times 0 plus 6 times 1, 
And the end result of all of that is we get the vector 5, 6 out of this thing. And all I need to know is basically what direction is the vector 5, 6 going. So if I came back to our picture, 5, 6 is basically going like out in that direction. So I would know that I've actually drawn the spiral incorrectly there. I have a spiral. It's spiraling outward. I know at this point it's going this direction. And so that's enough to tell me my spiral is spiraling outward in this direction, in a clockwise direction. And we could come back into the origin in some manner, but we know it's spiraling outward because it was an e to the 5t, so outward spiral because it had the sines and cosines, so sine of 3t and the cosine of 3t indicated that we had a spiral. And in this case is clockwise because of the velocity at the point 0, 1, which was up and to the right in the direction 5, 6. And so that's enough to get a sense of what that behavior looks like. So we'll come back and we'll talk more about these. These are going to be important when we start talking about nonlinear systems because we're basically only going to be able to determine the behavior of those systems in the context of looking at phase diagrams.